So find the others. That's the theme of this conference, actually. Find the others. It's taken from a Leary quote when they asked him, you know, after we've seen the light, you know, we've dropped our acid, had this experience, now what? What do we do? And he said, find the others. I kind of like that. Find the others. So that makes us others. And who are we as others? What does that mean? You know, there's two kinds of people in this world. People who believe there's two kinds of people and people who don't believe there's two kinds of people. I used to be the kind of person who believed there was two kinds of people. There was them and there was us others. I mean, and, and boy, we, uh, we work pretty hard to make sure people know we're the others, right? I mean, I'm standing in front of a devil's head, for God's sake, just to make sure they know we're, we're other. Counter fucking culture. I'm a card carrying member. I got a, got a medal, counterculture medal, because we're at war against them. I mean, talk about the easiest way to marginalize oneself is to become a counterculture, right? And we're identified. We got our medals, got our cards, our devil heads. Here we are. And who are the real others, finally? If there are others, I mean, how many women are going to be standing on this podium today? How many black people are in this building except carrying ice for our sodas in the back? That's passe counterculture. We don't talk about that. This is all intellectual. We're cool, don't worry. <laughs> what, what I mean to argue, and I'll do it in the time allotted, so I'll take off my watch here. Okay. What I mean to propose is that we've won. Period. We've won. They, whoever they are, have surrendered to us. And all we need to do now is declare victory. And that's actually what's happening, is we're slowly declaring victory. We're realizing that we've won. That the days of, bless his heart, the days of Art Bell really did end on New Year's Day. You know, he, how many books do we have to put out saying, doom is coming, doom is coming. I mean, who are the best at saying that? You know, the Christians, 2,000 years, done. Doom and gloom, you need it to hang on, to hang on to that, that difference, right? The saved and the damned, the ones who are going to make it through the bottleneck at the end of the time wave and the ones who aren't. Well, I think everybody makes it. I think this is the 21st century, right? Or almost. And duality is over. I think duality is passe. It's hard, I admit, it's hard to be in the so-called counterculture these days. Because the minute we do something, they figure it out, and it's at the mall in two weeks, right? And we don't want that, because it's our thing. How dare they? They're not us. They're them. And why? Well, the, the main reason we decide is because they're doing it with money rather than with the real conviction, right? They do it with money. They just buy the thing that we really believed in. That's their way of surrendering to us. Money is the only thing that they know that has value. So they're throwing it at us. Please, let us wear a piercing. Let us have a tattoo. Let us listen to the right music. We want to be like you, is what they're saying with their money. They're surrendering to us. But we won't take it because they're so mean and they're so wrong. Teach us, they say. Teach us. We just teach us. We don't know how. We have money. Here, take our money. We don't want your money. <laughs> Me. And then if one of us goes and says, well, maybe I'll take a little of their money. We go, oh, no. He's one of them now. He's one of them. He took their money. <sighs> the fact is we're all human beings here. I don't just mean here, I mean this whole planet. 
to all human beings, I, I think the battle, if there is one, is no longer us against them. I think it's us against it. And I'll try to define what that it is. It's very easy. I mean, we've all written screenplay treatments, which, which now are called business plans, but we've all, we all know screenplays. And the big thing you're supposed to do in the screenplay is personify the enemy, right? Personify him, because then you can, you know, there's this guy. Well, maybe we've seen too many movies, maybe we've written too many movies, but the enemy is not personified. There is no Mr. Big. There is no Mr. Bad. We all know this, but it's hard to remember that. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a little bit about how we got to this place, why we are so entrenched in us and them thinking, and then how potentially to break it. How we got here is easy. We basically invented technology as a way to control nature the natural rhythms of nature. We have light so that we can stay up at night. We have heating so we can live in cold places. We have airplanes which let us move in 10 time zones in 10 hours and what's it called? Uh, melatonin so we can fall asleep when we get there and dexedrine so we can get up the next morning and Prozac so that we can live in a life where we've defeated so many cycles. Then we develop media as a way to control populations. You know, so we have stories and associations and commercials which really are programming. I mean, that's why they call the stuff on television programming. Right? They're not programming the set or their schedule, they're programming the viewer. You choose your programming for one of three, now four, or eight, or twenty stations, but it's your programming. How do I want to be programmed today? Watch out, Microsoft is going to use that soon. Now, the main way we got programmed was through stories, right? And that, we, we all know how stories work, back from Bible and before through just stand commercials today. You create a character the audience likes, someone they can identify with, let that person make some decisions that get him into danger of some kind, and then come up with an answer, right? Like Tristan, like Arnold and a big gun, like Christianity, like family values whatever it might be. Get the audience in as much tension as they'll tolerate, and then give them the answer. And they'll accept your answer because they're a captive viewer. Well, what happened was the interactive devices, things like the internet, what Richard was talking about before, changed the way we related to the media space that was programming us. Thus, this thing happened. And quite simply, it was started with the remote control. Right? The remote control made it so now if you're being pulled into a story, into a coercive story where you're going to be sold a gun or an ideology or a candidate or a pill, bad pill, not a good pill like we do, one of their bad pills, don't worry. Now you can use the remote and get out, right? Boom. Deconstruct. Take apart the image. If you come back, you're not stuck in the story. You're just going to find out what it is. The remote control, to me, is the same moment in, in media history as the... Uh, the Zabruder tape, or film. Remember film? <laughs> the Zabruder film. It was a, a way of creating discontinuity. You know, the death of Kennedy itself. My God, people did not deal with that. Discontinuity, oh. And then we saw it, you know, frame by frame by frame by frame. Well, maybe they pulled out a few, we don't know. You know that new theory they pull out? Frame by frame by frame. So now media, instead of creating a story and programming us, media was being taken apart, and breaking down stories, promoting discontinuity, making people ask questions. Most boomers could not handle it. You know, they either, you know, jumped in and, 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 or, and said, okay, fine, we're just going to accept the official word on this, knowing that it didn't make sense, because they couldn't deal with the discontinuity, or they went out in that sort of Oliver Stone-like direction and went, oh my God, we've got to figure this out, put it together, who's behind it, oh, and never got over it. The joystick was the next invention that led to this more chaotic and, and I would argue, level playing fielded media space. I mean, if you think back to the first moment you played any kind of video game, it was probably, for most of you anyway, probably Pong. And if you think back, you know, it was probably in a hotel or at a convention or in some weird arcade. There's this black and white TV set and then you move a little black and white box up and down. And you went, wow, this is amazing, revolutionary moment. Now, was it because you were thinking, 
I love table tennis. I want to be able to practice table tennis without a partner around, so if the Chinese come, we're going to have another tournament, we're going to be able to beat them. No, you were thinking I have control of the pixel. That was the magic moment. And it changed our relationship to the screen. So the remote control was that sort of Kennedy-like deconstruction moment. We were no longer stuck in the story. The joystick was a demystification moment, that Pong moment. And the last device, of course, is the computer mouse and the camcorder, which now, instead of just receiving media, we can put out media. It turns the media into a do-it-yourself environment. And the, the sort of current event story I would tie to that would be the Rodney King tape, which changed the way people looked at CNN. It changed the way they looked at CNN, too. All of a sudden, now any story anywhere can come up. Media space is two ways, cameras everywhere. And this was a good time, if you remember the early days of the internet, text only actually, but hell of a lot more fun. It was a chaotic, joyful place. And we could, we could really, it felt like we could roam free through the media space. And we could really do our own kinds of pattern recognition. It was sort of like the early Talmudic scholars, you know, tying things, footnotes, that's the way the World Wide Web worked. It was tie this to that, and this is linked to that, and that's linked to this, which is how a conspiracy culture emerged from internet. We were making connections we hadn't made before. Now, a lot of us made a few too many connections. Once you get started making connections, it's hard to know where to stop, because the pictures are really pretty or really scary or really this. I mean, you can put whatever template on this place you want, and you'll be right, you know? Great, right. It was like that thing, right and right, right and right. So you're right. You're right. We're right, you know? We really are right. If we give that up, the whole thing gets better, though, I'll tell you, I promise. Okay, so we have this free-flowing media space, right? We deconstructed it, we demystified it, and we have a do-it-yourself media. Well, a couple of things happened to change all that. Some of them fine things, some of them kind of weird things. It's very easy to say they took it away from us because they wanted to make money off this thing and they were all mean. But they is us, finally. You know, it's hard to go hang out with your friends and tell them about email and stuff and they laugh you out of the room, oh yeah, right, I'm gonna have a computer on my desk. It's hard to play in a shareware universe where you get $5 a pop for a program that 60 people end up paying you for. It's hard. So we wanted, we wanted acknowledgement for what we were doing and we wanted to be paid for it. Meanwhile, there were some people who were very threatened, of course, companies, Time Warner for one, who were very threatened by the internet, threatened by this chaotic media space, threatened by the free flow of information. So they too needed to change the public perception of what this was. So they started with the end. We have a D DIY media space, a do-it-yourself media, where people are talking on the internet, people are making their own camcorder tapes. And what do they decide to call this thing? Communications revolution? No. They call it an information revolution. Well, why would they do that? Because information can be commodified. Information is stuff that can be bought and sold. This was not an information revolution. This was a communications revolution. This was people talking to one another. We were the content of this thing, not information. But information can be stored at, you know, HarperCollins in books that have copyrights, can be paid money. And what were the big issues then? Oh, copyright law and copyright protection. And how, as if that's what this was about. Did people talk about copyright protection on the telephone? So, okay, this is an information age then. Then we had to undo this demystification, right? All the kids playing with their pixels. How do we undo demystification? Well, remystify it. Look at Windows 98. Do you think anybody knows how that works? No, it's made by machine, actually. No one knows how that works. It's an opaque interface. Look at the difference between the World Wide Web and the Internet. The World Wide Web is flat. Can't get through, can't really talk, although now we have a program where if other people use it, you can make little marks, a little graffiti and some commentary on it. But no, the World Wide Web interface is not do it yourself. It's read it yourself, sit alone and click through it. Ooh, what do they got? I'm on the internet. 
and you get drawn inexorably towards the buy button. Then they had to undo our, our ability to deconstruct. Right? We're all deconstructing, we're all playing with the remote, moving from channel to channel to channel, leaving when the commercials come. So what do they call this? Attention deficit disorder. Attention deficit disorder for the most part, and I'm sure there's some real people with some real thing, but for the most part what it is, is an adaptive strategy, a reaction to a world where you're programmed everywhere you look. So you start pulling away. I mean, we live in what they call an attention economy now, right? Where they're competing for eyeball hours. So you drug the people so they can give you more eyeball hours. If you take Ritalin, I promise you'll be able to stare at boring websites longer. <laughs> the other thing the internet had to do was provide Wall Street and the investment community with a story capable of housing investment dollars. Right after the biotech crash in 87, there was no place for the money to go, no place for the money to grow. We were scared of Japan, other places, Russia, China, Finland. There was actual fear of Finland. <laughs> so the internet really becomes a story capable of housing other stories about how people are going to be able to make money. And as we all know, it essentially works like a pyramid scheme where someone gets angel investors to invest in his story then gets second round and third round investors as the pyramid gets wider, makes it to IPO, and then just has to keep the story alive long enough to execute what's called his exit strategy, which is where you get out and the last layer of the pyramid comes in. Believe me, real businesses do not require exit strategies. Exit strategy is the carpet bag when you run out of town. What holds it alive is faith. You know, faith in this pyramid, faith in the growth. And the net then becomes something that we're all building together, basically a body for corporate America. It's eyes, it's ears, even a little brain for it. And it's questing for money. It's job, the job. And we've all seen the new double-click stories and we all know how websites are designed to draw us toward the buy button. The job of the technology that we've built is to extract more money from us, right? And product from us when we're working. Whether we're calling ourselves an employee at the time or a consumer at the time, it's basically the same thing. Buy or sell and keep it moving. And our machines are getting very good at programming us. You know, the best writers used to do you know, used to do the books, and they did the movies, then they did TV shows, and they went from the TV shows and started doing the commercials. And now they don't even do commercials anymore. Now the best artists and writers, they do the actual buying experience. It's not the ad for the buying experience, it's the experience itself that has turned into the new entertainment. It's more efficient that way. And the techniques they use are straight out of Ericsson hypnosis, straight out of neurolinguistic programming, pacing and leading. Confusing. We are, in this sense, in the midst of a coercive arms race where our machines and our programmers develop a new strategy for compliance. We develop a new countermeasure, then they develop a counterattack for that, then we develop a new countermeasure for that. I mean, look at any of the, any of the commercial worlds that we live in. You know, we're all hip now to uh, malls, right? We're all hip that they're, that they're designed in this horrible architectural way to pull us in and make us buy more stuff. You know, the, the Gruen transfer and all that. We, we're hip to that. So now for us hip sort of NPR, Utney readers, simple people, they'll make the South Street Seaport or the Quincy Market. It's a historical mall. So you can feel good about taking your children there. And instead of going to Toys R Us, you go to Ye Old Kite Shop, which is probably a subsidiary and buy the same thing. And then for those of us that are smart enough to know that, we go, okay, now, now I don't want anything like that at all. No frills, no nothing. We're gonna go to Price Club and Home Depot, one of these plain warehouse stores. And the warehouse is a theme. Do you think that's coincidence that it looks like a warehouse? Think it is a warehouse? It's not a warehouse, it's a store. But they'll get forklifts going up and down and little pallets and we're like, oh, I'm getting the real thing here. 
got right through them. Go to the design meeting for a warehouse store sometime. We should make these out of metal? No, 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 wood, oh yeah. <laughs> now that machines are responsible for designing the environments and our consumption experiences, it gets a little scarier for me. In other words, if we have machines designing the information architecture of websites, using pacing and leading techniques, using permission marketing techniques, using one-to-one -one marketing techniques, then we end up getting drawn into really perverse accelerations of ourselves. What's the counter to that? I would say the counter to that is one is realizing that the problem is that there's no human being behind it. So the object of the game for us then is to find the humanity, cherish the humanity, if anything, augment the humanity. One thing I've been, I've been, uh, I don't know, arguing for in the various places I argue is um, Sabbath. You know, it's a really old, recipe, and it sounds really Christian and square, but maybe the ancients figured out that if people spend more than six days in a row involved in buying and selling and commerce, that they go a little mad, that they can lose it, that if every seventh day you reset and you have one day where you don't buy or sell anything and you actually, like Mr. Rogers says, you know, celebrate the fact that you're okay just the way you are, even if you're religious, sacred, just the way you are without doing anything then it's harder on Monday morning for them to compel you to act. By them, I mean the machine. Feed me, feed me, Seymour, feed me. The other thing is for us to realize that joy itself is experiential, not aspirational. If you have to do something to get joy, then that's not joy. I promise you, every time you have to do something in order to get the thing you want, and, and I don't just mean open the door to get in the room. Every time you have to aspire to joy, the thing that you're aspiring to is not joy. It's the screenplay. Your own screenplay, that's fine. Now, the reason why we've won is because the world is looking to us for a, the authentic joy that they're missing. The ravers, the punks, the goths, the weirdos. They want it in a safe dose because they're a little scared of it and they don't want to lose their homes. And at the same time, as Richard said, we've noticed, you know, a heated bull might not be such a terrible thing. Or a Lexus or whatever it is. I mean, and if we do want to hang on to our gray Ford Escort from 1974, we've got to realize that was a choice too. But they're looking to us for authenticity. They're looking to us for fun. I say, let them in. Take their money. It's corrosive to everything that we think they stand for. You know, let's accept their surrender. And even if they don't think of it as surrender, well, you know, so if they get upset that we call it that, we'll say, oh no, we're the ones who lost. Don't worry, you won. You won. I mean, can you imagine if we were that secure of ourselves to let them think that they won? We're not, though. Not yet. You know, I went through a, a, a weird shift over the last couple of years. I was a very much kind of a let it rip New Ager kind of guy. You know, follow the bliss, everything's going to be fine especially as the internet happened. It looked like, oh, counterculture, it's coming up, everything's gonna be great, it's all beautiful. Just go, go, go. And then I looked at some of the people who were using those same words. You know, Wired Magazine, corporate libertarian, yucky people, go, go, go. And it became the new language of faith for the NASDAQ, which will crash, I promise. And I was like, oh, that's terrible. So I actually, I went, back, I went back to Judaism for a while. I was thinking, well, there's got to be something in there. Where's the ethical template? How do we draw the line? Where, how do I differentiate between what I'm saying and that yucky thing that they're saying? The problem is, 
What I believed was that the go for it mentality of a sort of wire techno libertarian type would lead to fascism, finally. You know, and we have that example, right? Hitler, it happened in this, in this century. Shit happens, is what my grandmother says about Hitler. Shit happens. So we don't forget, we watch out, we draw the line in the sand. We're Jews, we live from the sand. Draw the line in the sand and don't let people, finally we stand up. Duality is real because if you don't believe in duality, look what happens. I believe the opposite's true, today anyway. I believe the opposite's true. I think duality is what leads to Hitler. There's us and there's them. Insiders, outsiders, Aryans and, and, and corrupt blacks and Jews. Women, ugh. us and them. Even if you don't accept that we've won, how about, as a, as a fallback position I'll propose, what if we pretend we've won? Or just believe we've won? And even let them think that they've won. I think that in the 21st century, the side that will win this thing is the side that no longer needs to see the other this way. Which is why it's fun to put this on ourselves. Because otherwise, the counterculture loses by definition. We really, really do. We are not counterculture. If we want to be anything, we're pro culture, right? They're counterculture. I won't buy it. I'm not counterculture. That's horrible. Why accept their label for that? That weird, marginalized, ghettoized, just like urban music, counterculture. No. Which is why I go back to find the others. Find the others. What did Leary really mean? Well, he might have meant find the other ones like us. But we're not others, we're us. I think what we sh the way we should define find the others, the theme of this very conference, is not to find the other ones like us, but to find the human beings in the others. Find the others. We still haven't found them. We're scared of them. We're angry at them. We hate them. They're begging us. They're looking for us. They're desperate to find us. DoubleClick is going to put cameras in our houses before long, I'm sure. They want to find us. They're looking. Well, let's find them too. But not the machine that's calling itself them. Let's find those people. I like that. Find the others. You know, the others. I mean, let's get, we'll, we'll get the us down with the rest of today. And then from here on in, let's really, what the heck? Let's find the others. Okay, thanks.